talk about hacking municipal elections. <laughs> um, and you know, I think we're all here because we know that, that that's a needed thing. A hack happens when people find the status quo intolerable. And I think that many of us in this room will be a little concerned about the direction of politics uh, south of the border and other parts of the world. And we don't want to ignore the fact that that right wing populist wave has washed over us before, um, particularly in Toronto. And uh, we are, we, you know, th there's a real risk in not taking action. Um, I want to just say that I know what it's like in my own bones uh, what it happens when democracy breaks down. I uh, came to Canada after a military coup, which happened in my uh, country, um, September 1973. Um, you know, that was a very different situation in the sense that there was a suspension of civil liberties, there was repression, there was torture. Uh, but the reality is that whether or not, um, you know, we have extreme situations like that here, the risks are similar. When people aren't able to exercise change through the democratic means, um, and so I think that today we know that people are grappling with that kind of reality. Like there's an uncertainty, a fear about the future, an insecurity that's leading a lot of people to think about um, their neighbor in a way that's a little bit frightening, a little bit disturbing. Uh, how many people here have canvassed before? I know some of you have canvassed a lot. Um, <laughs> I think that you, you will probably have heard at the door a, a lot of uh, sort of from people that are feeling economically marginalized, powerless. Um, that maybe it's that the person who's receiving social assistance or it's the refugee that's actually causing the economic hardships that people are facing. So that's a pretty risky situation that we're in. Um, you know, uncertainty and security, um, you know, the struggles that people face, they can be a fuel for hatred, for xenophobia, but they can also be a source of courage. And I think that's what uh, getting involved at the local level really allows us to do, is to find the courage in ourselves to go and talk to a neighbor um, and to ask them to find the courage to change their circumstances for themselves. So, like I said, I arrived uh, as a small child from Chile. Um, you know, it was a very different reality of a city without many migrants from the global south, as it's called. Um, I lived in a very uh, a white working class neighborhood. Um, we, there was a lot of resistance to the arrival of Chileans and a lot of, at the time it was called the Western Guard. Um, there was a lot of, there was violence. Um, you know, my dad faced it, his friends faced it in the community. Uh, but there was, a, the labor market was a bit different back then and people could get a job. And so we settled into an apartment, my parents started to work. I think that what really um, was difficult for me to see was that for my dad, literally, he lost his voice because of language. Uh, but for both of my parents who had been fighters in Chile, um, had been uh, very politically active, very involved, they had found their sense of being able to shape their community for a while. And that had a real impact on me. So that's my, my perspective on what it means to be powerless. There's many examples of having to, to uh, create a sense of identity of being Canadian here. Um, and uh, that really changed for me when, um, you know, I was, I was involved as a teenager in anti-racist work. And, but when I really started to feel like I, maybe I belonged, uh, that this place was mine, was when my daughter went to school. And I got involved in, um, in my local school, <coughs> in, the, uh, in the ward council. Um, it was a time when uh, the Harris government was in power and we were organizing delegations, 90 people from our ward to speak about the importance of local schools. Um, and so that was a really profound experience for me. It was finding for myself the, the, um, the means to help other parents find their voice, to feel that they could make a difference in their school, uh, to, that they were actually going to do something, stand up to power. Um, that was a really powerful experience for me. And that's what led to me running for city council. Now, people run to win. Um, I, I ran to be disruptive, and I think that this is what's exciting about what we're doing here, is that, you know, we're talking about disrupting a system that excludes largely women, that isn't very, you know, doesn't promote diversity in elected office, that's very difficult for youth to access in terms of being candidates and getting elected, and it's very difficult to imagine how you're going to make change. Um, the, for me, it was about, as, a, as a, a, a progressive Latina running in an area that was considered unfriendly to me, um, I wanted to make a point, and I did. Because we, what we did is just knocking on doors um, and building relationships. Um, when we talk about what's at risk in terms of the city of Toronto when we don't do that, um, I think that we know that 
um, Canada cities, communities are becoming more and more unequal. Uh, you know, this is the most unequal city in the country. And, you know, the, you think about uh, income, income differences have grown uh, 30, 35% in the last 30 years. But for neighborhood level um, in income inequality, it's, uh, it's 96% difference from neighborhood to neighborhood. And those, are really, those really create enormous threats and barriers to participation. Um, so for any of you, um, have any of you uh, campaigned in a community uh, where there's a lot of poverty, where there's a lot of people marginalized? Um, um, that's a, a, that is actually, a, a, I th to me, uh, the front line of what uh, this tool can do and why it's so important. For me, or, um, the, the act of campaigning is, first of all, to set the, the, the win that you want to achieve. Sometimes it's actually disrupting and putting an issue on the agenda. Everybody wants to run to win, but defining what that win is for you is really important. We're not all, we, we can't all win, particularly in races where 12 or 15 people are on the ballot at the local level. But we can actually do something that's even more powerful, which is develop relationships uh, with people one-to-one. -one. And the thing is that that, is, that can move so many things. Um, I think for me, um, the, the development of relationship is uh, really about how we build a sense of power uh, out of powerlessness um, that people are experiencing. And so getting involved in a campaign is an open invitation for people to think about what they want to see in their communities and how they might participate and take action to, to shape that future that's possible. Um, it's particularly important when people aren't seeing that the future can be changed. Uh, and I think that that's a really important thing about municipal elections. Um, you know, elections are a key moment in time. Um, they end on election day, but uh, the, that's where a lot of the work can begin. If you think about um, the kind of really responsive movements that are happening south of the border, um, th they will often tell you, those organizers, that election day is just a way to build a list. And then from there you run and you, you pick up the issue and then you keep organizing. Um, the municipal level is so key for these reasons. You know, the, you know, the, the place for me was uh, getting involved in the school <coughs> board that led to the issue of childcare, that led to the uh, question about parks, about public transit. And I think that uh, the, the experience that people have with touching these things in their daily lives is something that's incredibly powerful. Um, the idea, the notion that, that we're turning ideas into action, I think is also really powerful in terms of this relational thing. Um, part of what happens in a campaign is that we, we look at all of the, the many, many things that need to be changed, but then together we have a conversation about what we think is actually winnable. Um, you have to curate the big, the, you know, the big asks that you want to make and think about how you propose that as, as a value, as, a, as an opportunity to the people that are out in the constituency uh, to inspire them to actually believe that it's possible to build that better, that better future. Um, for me, it's been uh, the, the experience of running has, was incredibly, you know, fruitful. Um, so the first time I ran, uh, I, like I said, I was running to make a point. In 2006, I ran, and in my platform, you know, I ran on things like putting, uh, providing permanent uh, residents the right to vote in municipal elections. And then I got to work on that campaign, um, developing it, making the case, doing the organizing. I got in that experience to become um, a mentor to Desmond Cole. We worked together and we're still, for me, it's one of the, the most p profound experiences of my life is to have been able to support Des as he grew in his leadership. Um, you know, in that, in that campaign, we talked about uh, communities' right to know in the neighborhood about whether uh, toxics were being used or stored. Mm -hmm. um, so then I got to, uh, after that campaign, um, you know, with a renewed experience and the contacts. I was on the Toronto Board of Health. And it was a powerful thing for me to bring in that environmental and community-based uh, sort of movement and to be a part of the, the Board of Health that voted for environmental disclosure, which is then being, being picked up by the province. And it's, it's, an, it's a powerful idea. Um, all along the way, we're building more capacity to make change as we do these things. Um, at that time, we talked about landlord licensing and how important that would be. And 11 years later, the City of Toronto has voted for landlord mm -hmm. licensing. Um, so, uh, you know, change takes a lot of time. And the only way to actually deliver on change is to have the power to make it happen. And power is built by joining a small amount of power that we have as individuals with the power of, of another person. 
Um, in 2014, uh, by then, you know, there were, the issues had expanded, they changed, transit was really important. For me, um, it was an incredible opportunity to talk about community benefits and what it meant um, in my ward or potentially across the city to have people be able to shape or contribute or have a say, drive uh, local economic development. And you know, it's really, it's, it's a, it really struck at the heart of people's sense of marginalization about seeing cranes going <coughs> up or construction happening, but not, never imagining that my, my son or my daughter would be able to be on that job site or that somehow um, somebody in my family would be able to, to be connected to that economic opportunity. So um, you know, I, that was a, that's been a powerful experience for me. I, some, I, you know, I did the facilitation for the development of the Toronto Community Benefits Network, and I'm, I'm still involved on the board. But I think that's a really important emerging movement that we can tap in this, in this city. Um, I've spoken in <coughs> Calgary about it. Uh, I think that there's, there's something, there's a real, a real sense of possibility, uh, and that's what the local level provides. That's where a power is. Um, on, a, on, on, on a block, in a pole, in a ward, um, and you know, that's where change can, can happen. Um, yes, so the second thing for me that's been incredibly powerful about a campaign is that it's the practice, <coughs> it's the, the discipline of uh, I identifying potential people to work on the campaign, recruiting them, um, trying to understand what motivates them. Uh, how does a person go from feeling, uh, you know, fairly maybe passionate about an issue or interested in an issue to someone who can actually feel that they can exercise agency around it and lead other people, inspire them to take action together? Um, that, for me, has been the greatest legacy of my work in campaigns, uh, personally, is that I ended up uh, doing this kind of work for the last 10 years. I didn't know I was doing it before. Um, I got to exercise it in my role at Maytree. Um, and you know, I think that that's a really <coughs> important piece. Of work. And anyone of us that works on a campaign or is working, uh, and it doesn't have to be an election; it can be an issue-based campaign, is really in a, in that moment um, uh, scouting for new talent, for new possibilities. And people need the tools to actually participate. So it's it's really great to see that this this uh, open source sharing community that can uh, develop new tools that we don't know what's going to be needed or or. or who might be um, involved, who might come on board if they're invited. Um, so that, you know, there's Toronto Community Housing um, in my community, and from repeatedly going to those doors and talking in between about mini increasing minimum wages or um, talking about, uh, about a number of different campaigns that have been happening in the community, you can see the leaders rise up. And sometimes the leaders can be people that are facing multiple barriers. Um, but they're there if you invite them. They'll come out. You just have to be willing to put, make the investment, and, and that's another way to build power. Um, so at Maytree, I did this work. Uh, we did, um, and, and Chris and I worked together at the time, uh, developing um, the political leadership, uh, whether as candidates or as uh, campaign workers of people underrepresented, uh, racial, um, un underrepresented racial groups and immigrant groups in particular, refugees. And so we did have it, it, some successes. I'd say, you know, the election of Matthew Green in um, in Hamilton. That was something that I I hold very dearly. He was the first uh, uh, councillor of color, certainly the black first black councillor in a very diverse city. And he's uh, doing incredible work on payday lending, on carding, um, and, and um, supporting the expansion of transit in Hamilton. Um, so that's that's an that's a that's paying it forward <coughs> in a lot of ways. Um, I think that the question we need to ask ourselves when we start thinking about how we're going to participate in campaigns is who are we looking for? How, um, where, are the, where, are the new, where are the voters going to come from? Um, in a lot of places where we are going to be running campaigns that are disruptive, that are, ha that are hacking the system, um, the available votes are already taken up by people who feel quite comfortable. That's the status quo. So we have to ask ourselves, where is the disruption going to take place on our end? And I'd suggest that we need to think about new voters. Um, in 2006, an incumbent councillor lost in um, the northwest of the city um, because, um, simply because his opponent uh, ran on this question of, of, of uh, buildings and the, the, the need to do landlord licensing, and 400 new tenants voted for the first time. That's the way to flip that situation. Um, I recently worked on the, um, on the campaign um, and, you know, as a volunteer of uh, the new mayor of Saskatoon, Charlie Clark. 
Now, Charlie had 10 years of, of being <coughs> on, on, at Saskatoon City Council, uh, but there was a real need for a change there. And, you know, he came out from third place to win that election um, without ever changing his, his sort of, uh, without ever uh, compromising on his values or on his offering. Uh, climate change is a huge issue in Saskatoon. Housing, inequality, poverty, marginalization, at the street checks and carding were an issue. And, um, and, and Charlie was able to do something that was really historic, which was to capture um, a majority of Indigenous voters who came out to vote for the first time. And that's how that election was flipped. It wasn't, it wasn't, because, uh, it wasn't only because sort of businesses and, and artists and millennials really came on board with him. It was that there was an, a, an, an available pool of voters there that nobody <coughs> had really talked to and asked. Um, and the way that that was delivered was disruptive, not in the sense of it wasn't a, a digital tool, <coughs> but it was relationship-based. It was the deep, deep relationships in, in the indigenous communities in Saskatoon that allowed uh, you know, workers to go uh, into housing and to go into all kinds of neighborhoods and say, okay, let's go and vote. And, and that was, I'd never seen anything like that before. Uh, it wasn't identified support, it was based on relationships. So I would say go back to the idea that when we're identifying vote at the door, we're not just saying, oh, will you vote for me or not? We're actually opening the possibility that we're gonna develop a new relationship because somebody might not be with you today, uh, but you're developing a conversation and opening up a bridge um, in a place and in a place that, that can be uh, turned into a lot of social capital. Um, I think that ultimately what I'd like us to see do is help communities uh, address this idea of the sort of this, the sense of not having a future, of feeling insecure, of wanting to blame a neighbor for <coughs> difficult economic situations by turning the conversation around. And I think that what a campaign can do at the local level is actually help people to find what a collective identity is, um, reshape that in a, in a way that's progressive and that's inclusive. It's the process of helping people to find that they have a voice and to actually they have the experience of exercising that voice. There's nothing more powerful than going to knock on someone's door and they open their door and they share their hopes and their fears with you. Um, and, and, that, and that's an experience that everybody should, should have many times over. Um, I think that the, the next step from there is an experience of exercising agency, to actually understand that we can make a difference, that we can shape our future together. And I would say that what we can't ever lose sight of is that the things that people need to experience wins, material wins in their communities, uh, something tangible that they can relate to, that they can show other people, see when you got involved you were able to deliver on something. So at, after election day, don't give up, continue to work, continue to uh, make sure that the investment that you made, that the promise that you made, whether you're a volunteer or a candidate at the door, is for me a binding contract with people. That it means that you're actually gonna be there to support them in their fights later. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that's, um, that really has to be focused in the coming years on people being able to have, see a difference in their income and their housing and the transit that they take and the things that matter. And I think that this is m more critical than ever. Um, I, you know, the, we all know that this, this idea about blaming other people, um, that blaming um, you know, Canada, <laughs> that, blaming, um, that blaming Muslims or immigrants is something that's got a lot of currency. And I don't think that we can ignore the fact that th those ideas are deeply rooted in Canadian society. I certainly experienced them as a child, experienced that fight in their late 80s and early 90s when um, up and down here on Young Street there were brawls at Young and Eglinton between anti-racist activists and people wearing full skinhead, uh, um, sort of white supremacist skinhead uh, outfits and we don't want to go back to that time. <coughs> we want people to feel that this inclusive, uh, this, this, the communities that we're building are actually going to be an incredible asset to us and, and so um, I would say that you know those are the people in this room, a lot of us have a lot of privileges uh, we probably have a sense of the future, but just want to ask you, if you've ever, have you ever felt outrage about a situation around you and a sense that you didn't have any power to change it? Some people? Um, well, that's, um, th I think on our own, we can't do very much, and we've all probably experienced a sense of helplessness at some time, but relationship building, um, whether it's digital or whether it's in person, 
is, is one to one, quickly can become 20. <coughs> 20 becomes 1,000, and then 1,000 easily becomes thousands of people. So uh, that practice and, that, and, and that, you know, that commitment has to be front and center. Um, campaigns provide us the opportunity to turn our values into action, mm -hmm. to create community-driven agendas, <coughs> uh, to create a sense of a, co a collective identity, to build teams, to build, um, to build power ultimately. Um, campaigns are a chance to do it once and then do it again and again and learn and innovate and that's why it's great that this tool is sustainable over time. So I, I can't conclude without doing a call to action of course because it's about <laughs> politics. So I hope that you will all continue to support this work and that if you haven't experienced yourself what it means to ask somebody to support your vision, your idea, that you get out on the door and that you do it immediately that you have the political conversations that are going to really make a difference to people, that you invite someone who isn't involved to come and, take and, and to see themselves as a political actor. And I think that we can make a lot of difference, uh, build resistance to ideas that we want to exclude, and actually um, create the society that we want for ourselves. Uh, you, you, you rightly expressed many concerns about growing.